Take it away, Jennifer. Thank you. Very exciting energy. I love it. Um, so very excited to be here. Happy to talk to you all about um, accessibility in one of my favorite tools called Pally. Um, if, if you uh, would like to join me in my reality TV fandom, you can follow me at like OMG at Spetty on Twitter. I mostly tweet about that. Sometimes I tweet about tech stuff. It, it's kind of a, a mix. Um, and I'm from a place called Kansas City in the middle of the United States. This is where it is on the map because everybody's heard about New York or they've heard about LA and I say Kansas City and they're like, where's that? And then it's a whole explanation thing. So here you go, that's where I live. The important thing you need to remember is our most valuable export, Paul Rudd. You may know him as Ant-Man. Um, also very good and clueless, would recommend that movie. Uh, so very excited to be able to open the conference uh, and talking about accessibility, it's a good idea to talk about how we can be accessible as a community. Is anybody familiar with the Pac-Man rule? All right, a couple of you, awesome. Uh, so networking is a huge part of conferences, and so I would like to encourage you to try and implement the Pac-Man rule in your own groups. And so instead of standing in a circle like we tend to do to gather around, you want to create the shape of a Pac-Man. You want to leave a little gap opening so new people can come into the circle and kind of talk and get to know each other. So that should be your goal um, for, for during the breaks, is making sure you're implementing the Pac-Man rule to make your groups and your conversations accessible for everyone. Uh, but talking about accessibility, why should we care? We have enough on our plates as developers already, implementing all the features and things that we need to worry about. So why does accessibility matter? There are an estimated 1 billion people in the world who live with disabilities. That's 15% of the population, 15% of the people who are using our websites, who are using our applications. And so that's a very large part of our community that we're excluding by not creating accessible products. Uh, so what are some of those issues that these users might have that are leading them to struggle with, with using applications? Uh, a lot of people are going to have visual impairments. This could mean blindness. Uh, but another issue we don't always think about is this idea of color blindness, people who cannot differentiate between different colors. Uh, so it's important to be aware of those kind of issues when designing color schemes and, and palettes for applications. Uh, people might have auditory impairments, meaning they are uh, dealing with deafness, partial deafness. They're needing to rely on something like subtitles or text that we're so lucky to have provided for us today. Uh, they might have motor impairments. This is one that gets forgotten about a lot. Um, people who have actual physical defects, maybe a loss of limb or something like that. Uh, they might have some sort of condition due to their age. They lack finite motor control and can struggle interacting with websites or applications. Uh, diseases can also cause motor control that, that we don't have um, the ability to interact with things the way we would expect. Or other struggles using a mouse or keyboard. Does anybody have kids in the room? You remember when you had that baby under your arm and you're trying to do everything with one hand? Uh, so these are actual concerns. It doesn't just have to be disease or something like that. It could be something very conditional where you don't have full use of, of both hands to use a website. Uh, there are a lot of other considerations that people might not realize fall under the accessibility category. This includes mobile devices, so it's not just the, the websites or applications we're building, it's the way they're being used on other devices. Slow internet connectivity is actually a big part of accessibility. Uh, we want to make sure that we're designing and building content for users who might not have high-speed internet to access the kind of data that we might be used to. Uh, and we also need to be aware of the way users manipulate devices. Uh, they might use the zoom-in feature on a phone or a browser, and so making sure that the way we're building those products allows for those kind of um, user interactions and, and letting them have control of the way they view their content. Uh, so this term, Alley, accessibility, is a measure of a computer system's accessibility to all people, including those with disabilities or impairments. Uh, it's related to both software and hardware and the way they can be configured in order for a disabled or impaired person to use the computer system access successfully. Uh, so kind of a, a broad uh, understanding of what accessibility means and the way we need to think about it. Uh, so there's a general accessibility checklist. Uh, you might be familiar with some of these attributes. If you're not, take note. Um, these are different things or different elements uh, or ways we can put semantic markup inside of our applications that help make sure that our apps are accessible. Uh, things like landmark roles, using language attributes, um, ensuring that we have semantic headings. I know uh, some of you might feel a little attacked because you know when you've been too lazy to do styling properly and you put an H2 tag on top of an H1 tag just so you don't have to CSS. Am I the only one who does that sometimes? Couple, couple nods, yeah. Uh, so thinking about the fact that we need to use uh, markup and, and headings in the way they were intended to use and not just what's easiest for us at the time. 
uh, making sure that our links have focus states and are recognizable. Uh, I know the, the web has gotten a bit interesting in the way we design and create links and navigation, but we need to consider not only how cool it looks, but ensuring that it's, it's visually communicated to a user that it is a link or something that needs to be clicked on. Uh, ensuring that we have alt text on images, I feel like that's tends to be common knowledge, uh, but also understanding that we're um, handling forms properly, making sure our labels are appropriately describing our inputs using uh, placeholders, having validation that's, that makes sense in a way that a user should um, be able to use that form. Um, making sure that we have audio and video uh, capabilities, whether that's providing transcripts or subtitles for people who have um, visual or audio impairments, making sure that we have color and contrast um, paid attention to, and then ensuring that our applications can be uh, used by a screen reader or somebody who might not have a mouse to navigate. They might just be able to tab through a website and use um, keyboard navigation only. Uh, so an important understanding about accessibility are, are the standards. And when we talk about an accessibility testing tool, it's going to test all these things, but in order to understand what those, what those results mean of those tests, we need to understand what the tests are based on. Um, so there are a lot of standards. Uh, the, the big one is the, the WCAG uh, standard. And then I like to include Section 508. You may not be familiar if you're not from the United States, but this is our, um, our standard that is implemented by law. And so it, this means if you have a website that gets any sort of government money, meaning an educational institute, uh, some sort of uh, nonprofit, uh, anything that gets money from our government, if they do not have an accessible website, um, they are in deep legal trouble and, and can basically get sued into oblivion. Um, so if you see Section 508, know that that applies to um, websites and applications in the United States. Uh, but if we look through some of these guidelines, we can begin to understand uh, what accessibility means and what we need to be doing specifically to make sure that our websites are usable. Um, so this was last updated June 5th of 2018. Uh, so they are constantly making updates and making sure that uh, we are updating documentation to understand and know the kind of things we should be thinking about. But they've been broken out into these main categories. And the first category is perceivable. Uh, so the way we're, we're looking at content and able to perceive and understand what's going on. And so this includes uh, providing text alternatives for non-text content like images. So if somebody is visually impaired and are looking at images on the website or looking, uh, a screen reader is able to tell them what one of those images might be. Uh, we want to make sure that we can create content that can be presented in different ways without losing information or structure. Um, so as our web pages scale and things change, that that information is still presented in a very logical way. Uh, and making sure that users can see and hear content, uh, including separating foreground from background. Uh, I was actually working on a, a client project earlier this week and implementing some of their designs that their designer had worked on, and I'm implementing this, and I'm noticing that even me as a very able-bodied user am struggling to uh, distinguish the, the text that they had created from the background because the colors were so nice. And yes, it was pretty, and yes, it was nicely designed, but I knew that if I was having trouble seeing it, somebody else would. And so I was able to use a contrast checker against it, go back to that designer and say, hey, I'm concerned that a user might not be able to differentiate this text. Um, so empower yourself to kind of begin to understand accessibility and get comfortable with having these conversations and learning to learn to advocate for accessibility. Um, the next subsection, subsection is adaptability. Um, this can relates to how um, things work with each other or how they are labeled. Uh, so we want to make sure that everything is presented in a meaningful way. Um, people are used to having the navigation at the top of the page. Uh, so having something that, that makes sense and is, is assumed to be there. Uh, making sure that orientation is available. So whether you're viewing it on a, a very wide browser, or maybe something more narrow, if you're doing mobile or responsive design, uh, that everything is still presented in a logical way. Um, and making sure you're identifying purpose. And so when we are designing these really cool icons, sometimes they start to not look so much like icons. And so making sure that we're distinguishing those as, as areas that a user could interact with. Um, we also have distinguishable. Again, this is making sure that the pieces that we want to be interacting with are, are standing out. Uh, and a user is able to very easily decipher, oh, this is a piece of the, of the page or the application I need to interact with. Um, then we get into the section of uh, being operable. And so this is where we need to make sure that all functionality is available from a keyboard. Uh, I don't know what it is, but banking websites, I feel like, are notorious for not implementing these standards. And you'll try and tab through the fields really quickly, and it never quite works right. Um, so think about that, you as a, a visual and capable user. If you're somebody trying to navigate a website without a mouse and trying to rely on that tab functionality, and it's all over the place, 
really, really bad, really awful user experience. Um, we also wanna make sure that we're providing users enough time to read and consent. Um, so I know automated pop-ups and modals uh, have, have kind of come into fashion on occasion, and so making sure that our, our users aren't caught off guard or they have enough time to read and understand that information. Um, and making sure that we're providing ways uh, for users to navigate and find content and figure out where they are. Uh, we have another subsection uh, that our, our content, our websites need to be understandable. Uh, so this is making sure that our text content is readable, distinguishable, um, and that our web pages appear and operate in predictable ways. Uh, and another big part of this is helping users avoid and correct mistakes. The thing that comes to mind here is form validation and making sure that if we have required fields that those are clearly marked to a user, um, if they do something incorrect, maybe type in an email address incorrectly or something like that, that we're providing them feedback that lets them know what those mistakes they've made are and figure out how to correct them. Uh, and finally, we have uh, robust as, as an entire category, and this uh, includes making sure that compatibility with current and future user agents, including assistive technologies, are always supported. Uh, so essentially, this means change is the only cons. This applies to accessibility. Accessibility means no matter how the web changes, no matter how devices change, we need to make sure that we are supporting and creating accessible content no matter what happens. As engineers, it is our responsibility to build accessible products. If we want to create the kind of world, the kind of web that we want to see, we need to consider all people of, of all ranges of abilities. It is our responsibility, and this is something that we can really do and take ownership over to make the web a more accessible place. So, if you're excited and you're like, yes, Jennifer, okay, I'm on board, let's make the web more accessible. How do I do it? Let me tell you. Uh, first of all, you need to know your accessibility accessories. Uh, Axe is a really popular one. A lot of people might be familiar um, with their extension they have in Chrome that you can go and use that extension and test on pages. You might be familiar with Lighthouse, uh, which comes inside of Google Chrome, inside of the dev tools. Uh, you can do a lot of things. You can do progressive web application testing in there. You can do accessibility testing, SEO, all sorts of great stuff. Um, this is a really powerful contrast checker tool that I find myself using a lot uh, just when I'm, I'm working through design iterations and making sure that uh, it passed with an appropriate contrast level. And Pally, which is what we're going to be talking about today. So, uh, Pally, you can find more information at pally.org. They are actually working on a website redesign. It's, it's a little bare bones right now, but uh, the content underneath is fantastic. Uh, so, Pally is an automatic automated accessibility testing pal. It runs HTML code sniffer from the command line for programmatic accessibility reporting. Uh, so you, if you're not familiar with HTML code sniffer, basically what this does is it goes and it looks through your markup uh, and allows you to paste in code directly from their website and then it will check it against those standards that I looked at. Um, so the great thing about this is you don't have to remember all these different accessibility standards. This tool is going to run against your code, figure out exactly what you've done wrong, and then point out against it. Um, so we can actually look through here. Uh, this is what the web accessibility standards look like. A lot of plain text, not fun to read, but hopefully I will save you all that trouble by showing you this tool so you don't have to worry about it. Uh, but if you're ever curious about the kind of errors that are throwing, you can um, check out uh, w3.org to find out more about uh, specific Im implementations. All right. Uh, so it's important to know the latest version of Pally runs Puppeteer. And so what Pally is going to do is it's going to launch a browser instance and it's going to run tests against that using the JavaScript interface. Uh, this allows us to crawl single page applications and interact with them and, and do different things uh, to run accessibility tests after. Uh, we can also take screenshots with it, which is a really powerful tool. Um, if you're not familiar with end-to-end -end testing or, or running inside of a headless browser, it can be a bit of a mind trip. And so being able to take screenshots and see exactly what's going on during these tests uh, can be really, really helpful. Uh, so let's look at testing some websites. Uh, has anybody seen the show Gossip Girl? Yes, yes, trashy, trashy teen, uh, teen TV shows. I love them. Um, so I was basically pretending that I was Gossip Girl and have decided uh, maybe uh, I need to look at making my website more accessible so everybody can find out all the drama and the gossip. Uh, so I have uh, rebuilt GossipGirl.com in all its uh, early 2000 glory. Uh, and so we, we've got some, some lovely stuff going on. And so this is GossipGirl.com and I'm going to begin to run accessibility tests against here. 
Uh, so right now I just have a local build instance running. I've built it in Angular, but Pally does not care what your, your JavaScript framework of choice is. It will test anything you want. Um, so I've got this running, and so what I'm going to go ahead and do is I'm going to use the um, uh, Pally command line interface to run some tests. Uh, so I can just run the Pally command and pass in whatever website I'd like to test against. So I'm at local host 4200 here, and it's going to go ahead and start to run some tests. And I will zoom in a little bit so you can see that better. Um, so here's kind of what that output is going to look like. It's going to let me know how many errors that are not passing, how many accessibility issues I have on the page, and let me know what's going on. Uh, so this first one is image element is only the content of the link, but missing alt text. The alt text should describe the purpose of the link. Um, so essentially, I have this, this logo linked to the home page, but I'm not letting somebody know, hey, this is a link to the home page. So I can begin to go in and see what's going on here. Uh, this output is going to tell me what specific principle uh, my, my code is violating. It's going to uh, allow me to see where it is inside the page, and then it'll give me a, an exact example of what that, that markup is, so I can go and look and begin to fix my code. Uh, so we can do a lot of stuff from the command line, uh, which is good for a first view, not necessarily the most helpful in a typical development process. Uh, we've got a lot of things on our plate, uh, so let's figure out how we can use uh, Pally to really kind of optimize that workflow. Um, so if you want to run from the Pally CLI, you can get some direct output. Uh, you can pipe in different features to output that report to an HTML file instead of just inside the command line, uh, but not necessarily typical in a, a development workflow. Uh, so Pally also offers um, the CI, which will allow us to basically create a, um, a file that we can put in multiple URLs and report on issues, because it's not very often you're just going to want to test one page of your website, right? You're going to have a lot of different interactions, you're going to have different pages, you're going to have steps um, piecing through a form, and so we can begin to create really robust build processes um, using Pally CI to test those. Uh, the great thing is we can also use it as a gatekeeper. We can set a failure threshold, uh, like say we have five accessibility errors. Okay, we're going to go ahead and not let the build continue until we go back in and fix these, these issues. Uh, so we can go ahead and start to create a, a file that looks like this, um, just call it .pallyci. Uh, we can set whatever rule set that we want to be running against. Uh, we can begin to pass in our URLs, and then we might have to take cer certain actions on our page. Um, so for instance, my very fancy gossipgirl.com site uh, pops up this modal. Well, I might want to get rid of this modal before I run more accessibility tests so I can see the content on the page behind it. Uh, so that's how we can begin to use uh, these different actions to do things. Uh, and then when we run this, we can just uh, run the Pally CI command and set a threshold for, our, for how many errors we want to allow to pass before um, failure is determined in halting the build. Uh, this can be really good for your team because not everybody may have attended a session on accessibility, not understand, and so if you have some sort of tool letting them know, hey, these are some errors that you made when you were updating this feature, refactoring this code, that can be really, really powerful for us in our workflow. Uh, because again, uh, code change is the only cons, so we want to make sure that as we're changing code, as we're building new features, we are constantly testing for accessibility and making sure that any no, new code that we push out um, is going to be accessible and usable for our users. Uh, so we also have a JavaScript interface uh, where we can have a little bit more granular control. Uh, so in this case, we can go ahead and call Pally on whatever URL that we want to run our test against, uh, pass in some configuration options that I'll, I'll explain in a minute, and then get our results and do something with them. So instead of relying on command line, we can begin to create really robust configurable reports uh, that we can use to display in a way that makes sense. Uh, so one of the things to know about Pally is what that result output is going to look like. Um, so when we are getting our results from running our tests, it's going to give us the document title, um, the, the title of the page that we are testing, because again, if you're testing a very uh, robust website, maybe you've got hundreds of pages to look through, you want to know what page, what tests are failing on. Uh, it's going to give us that specific page URL, uh, and then it's going to give us an array of issues where it'll let us know what principle has been violated, uh, what the context, what the offending element is, uh, what kind of a human readable message. Um, as well as the selector to where to go and find it on the page. Uh, so this is consistent across all of Pally. This is what the, the results output is going to look like. Uh, 
we have a lot of different features that we can use with Pally. Uh, we can use a sync and a wait uh, to kind of deal with some, some behavior that we tend to run into with uh, JavaScript. Uh, we have actions, and so these are really, really helpful. Uh, and it's important to know that these actions are going to run before every test. Uh, so as you begin to think about setting up your accessibility test, okay, you think, oh, I'm gonna navigate to a URL. All right, well, let's say I have a login form that I need to fill out before accessing another part of the application. That's how we can use actions to go and begin to move through that login form, complete the login process, and then move on to test a page. Um, we can also make sure that we're waiting for different elements to be visible uh, because you don't really have that granular control of everything loading. Uh, you can begin, you can go in and say, all right, well, I wanna wait for this modal to be visible before I start to run tests against that and kind of control the, the flow before Pally begins to run the tests. Uh, we can also verify the actions, and this is really helpful to do because sometimes you'll have an action that you try and you try and click a button on a page that might not exist yet, and Pally is essentially going to silently fail and be like, "Yay, gold star for you! You have no tests or no problems." Uh, but what's really happened is it just failed and didn't get to the point where it was actually running tests against your page. Uh, so we can use um, is valid action. So we can uh, click an element with an ID of submit that would return true because that submit button is there. If we try an action called drink more champagne, that is false. You cannot drink more champagne in HTML. Um, uh, you can also hide elements. So in a case that maybe you are dealing with some sort of uh, third party element, uh, like on my, my little Gossip Girl website here, I am using uh, Google Maps and I can't necessarily control the way they are handling accessibility. I might want to hide that um, from my accessibility tester so errors that are um, in, a, in code that I'm not controlling aren't going to come up. Uh, we can also uh, have a variety of different logs. Um, sometimes the, the default setting, the info setting, can be just way too much um, content, and so we can choose our different log levels to understand uh, what we want to be outputting. Uh, we can also set some different properties on our page. Uh, so if, if you remember back to different accessibility principles, one of those is making sure that responsive designs are, are um, considered. So we can set our viewport size for our different um, tests to see what something is gonna look like at a desktop view versus a mobile view. Uh, if you need to set certain cookies or certain authentication tokens for your login process, you can do that as well. Uh, you can set your rules and standards. Uh, I would recommend um, just doing the um, WCAG standard. Uh, AAA is, is the highest, best level to be doing it at, um, but you can start at just the single A or, or the double A. Those are gonna cover your, your base level requirements. Um, and then the most helpful thing that I've run into is, is the screen capture. And so this will take a screen capture of whatever is going on in your test and you can use that to at least visually debug and understand if you've maybe forgotten something or, or didn't realize that, that this one interaction needed to happen before. Um, so really great troubleshooting there. We can also use timeout and wait. And so if we know that maybe a request is gonna take a little bit longer to finish or something like that, we can have more control uh, before we begin running our tests. Uh, so let's take a look at uh, some code that I've created around my GossipGirl.com website uh, to run some different tests and see what's going on. Uh, so I have uh, a couple files here. I've just uh, created a Pally file where I am going to pass in just a simple URL. So I'm going to test just the home page of my application. Uh, and the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, pass in some actions. So I'm going to wait for that modal content button to be visible, the, uh, the button that's going to get rid of the modal, and then I'm going to click that so then I can run my test after the modal is gone. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and create a screen capture uh, and just put it in the directory that I'm running this command from. And then here is where I'm doing something cool with the results. So I'm getting the results and we looked at that um, where it's giving you the document page title and then the list of different issues. Uh, when we looked at it, it kind of from the command line, it, it's a little hard to read here, and so I prefer to put it into an HTML file that I can easily pass over to somebody and they can see exactly what's going on. So that's gonna take these results. Uh, it's going to write them into an HTML file I've created, um, and then we can use that uh, to do a bit better job of visual debugging. Uh, so I can do, uh, I've got a couple commands set up, uh, and all this code will be available at the end. Uh, so I've got this basic test written, and so it's going to give me some output that's letting me know it's running Pally. It's going to go ahead and launch Headless Chrome, uh, letting me know that it has run my actions. If one of my actions did not run, uh, it would let me know and it would fail. Um, got my actions run. At this point, it's going to inject the HTML code sniffer, and then it's going to run the tests 
uh, take a screenshot, uh, and then let me know what's going on. Uh, so we can go ahead and open these. All right, uh, and so now I have some nice output going on here where I can see whatever errors, um, and I've got a little more styling here, so it's much more easy to read and figure out what's going on. Uh, so we can begin to kind of look through the, the mistakes that I have made in, in building my website and figure out what's going on. Uh, so we kind of already looked at this image element uh, that I need some sort of alt text to describe. Uh, you'll also notice here that uh, I made an uh-oh, so I have an error about my heading structure not being logically nested. Um, it's looking at the, the order of my um, heading elements, and I've got an H4 where it would probably make more sense to be an H2 because it's a, a more high priority heading. So I can begin to go look through my code base and fix these issues. Uh, so if we wanted a more robust solution, uh, we can begin to do some really complex and awesome stuff. Uh, so again, it's not very likely that you're just gonna be running accessibility tests against one page. You wanna be running accessibility tests on every little piece of your website. Uh, so we can begin to uh, use the JavaScript interface to uh, build some really complex tests. Uh, so here I am going to go ahead and have an array of uh, pages that I want to run against, uh, go ahead and create actions that I know will be required for those pages, um, and then I can pass that into a function where it'll then go iterate through all of those different pages that I've passed it and write it to this custom dashboard. Uh, so we can take a look at what that's going to look like. And so this is going to run over all of these different um, URLs that I've passed in and uh, run the specific commands that I've created for each and then create a, a custom dashboard that I can then uh, use and, and see more clearly what issues I need to fix. So this is just a custom dashboard I created where it's going to automatically link out any of the pages that I ran test against. Uh, and then I can click into them and see exactly what errors are specific to that page. And then it's also, I've taken a screenshot and written it into this file so I can see exactly what's going on. Uh, so it, I see that my image element is missing an alt attribute, so I can go into my code base, I can look for that component, and yep, I've got an image tag here where I'm not passing in any sort of alt or description of what's going on, so I can begin to correct that. Uh, and you may be thinking, well, um, Jennifer, that, that sounds like a lot of work. I don't really want to create my custom dashboard. Um, Pally actually has its own dashboard that you can use. Uh, so if you're not wanting to write your own, you can use what they have, and you can actually integrate it um, with uh, a database as well, so you can see your accessibility reports over time. Uh, so if you uh, want to create some sort of performance metrics around your team and say, hey, we want to uh, benchmark and hit this, um, this few accessibility errors, you can see how your team progresses over time. Um, so the Pally dashboard is, is a really great tool. Uh, all right, uh, so one of the other things uh, we need to think about is the, the fact that we have responsibility for building accessible applications, and it's very easy to just sit down and, and write code and go home and, and call it a day. But if we really want to be the best developers we can and build the best web we can, we need to learn to, to advocate for the things that matter. Um, so if you are going back to work and you're like, all right, I heard about this great tool called Pally. How do, I, how do we figure out how to use it? Um, and they're like, oh, well, we don't want to spend extra time or extra money. Um, here, here are some ways that you can, you can get your team on board for um, implementing Pally. The great thing is it is very minimal um, effort to implement. You know, pass it a URL, pass in some actions, pretty easy setup. Um, there are immediate improvements available. So any random small stuff on, on your website or application, you'll be able to catch very quickly and correct. It's going to take not a lot of time. Pally is doing all the hard work for you, calling out the, those elements that need to be fixed. Um, you can argue uh, that audience retention matters. If you ever want to get uh, something done uh, around code, relate it back to dollars. So if we go back to that figure of 15% of the world, uh, people living with disabilities and you, and you go um, to like your, your business and you're like, hey, we're losing 15% of users, that means this much money in revenue that we're losing out on because our product isn't accessible, all of a sudden they start to care a little bit more about what accessibility means. So if all else fails, relate it to dollars. 
Um, building customer, customer loyalty is, is a big part of that too. Uh, people who are able to use your website to purchase products or, or uh, whatever you're trying to sell are going to come back if they can use it. If they can't use it, they're going to go to your competitor. Um, you may not realize this, but uh, accessible websites play into SEO. Uh, so you will get higher SEO rankings if your website is accessible and, and semantically appropriate. Um, this also includes page speed load. So if your website is taking too long to load, you actually go down in, in Google rankings. Um, and, and then the big one is, uh, we can avoid getting sued. Nobody wants to deal with lawyers and deal with drama. Uh, so if your team's like, oh, well, no, I, I really don't want to spend the time on that, you're like, well, we'd spend a lot more time dealing with lawyers and litigation if somebody got upset with us and sued us for our website not being accessible. So I, I hope you're excited, I hope you're inspired, uh, and see how easy it can be uh, to to make sure that you are creating accessible websites. So I encourage you all to go forward, become an accessibility BFF, uh, and, and help us make the, the web a more accessible place. Um, if you have any questions, please find me to chat during the breaks. I'd love to talk to you. Uh, there's my email address. If you start to implement Pally, you run into any issues, I'm happy to help. Uh, and slides are available at that link. So this is the slide if you would like to take a photo of. I know, I'm like watching for cameras. Yeah. Couple flashes. All right. Well, I hope you have a lovely rest of your day, you wonderful human beings.